Right, hi there IB psychologists. Today we're looking at an evolutionary explanation of behavior or more specifically what this phrase means and how we can address it if it comes up in an exam question because this is one of the key topics in the biological approach. Um, so what we're looking at is um, we're actually just trying to figure out what this phrase means an evolutionary explanation of behavior and I'll give you an example that I think is going to work really well in the exams which is um, explaining fear from an evolutionary perspective. So, the plan. We're going to begin with the explanation. What is an evolutionary explanation of behavior? Uh, we'll look at an example, and then I'll finish off by giving you some exam tips and some, some ways that I would suggest writing good short answer questions for this possible question or um, essay responses as well. All right, so let's just recap with some of the basics about evolution. Um, now, before I begin, though, I think it's the tricky thing with this topic is you can get really biological and really specific, and I think that can actually make it very complicated. So we are going to keep it very simple, and I think even by keeping it simple, you can still write top answers that allow you to get a 6 or a 7. So if we just have to remember that the biological purpose of life is to procreate. If we don't procreate, if we don't pass on our genes, life dies out. So this is the, the, the crux of evolution. Uh, and so we've evolved to behave in ways that are going to help our survival, which means we've evolved to behave in ways that are going to help us pass on our genes. All right. And if we think so, so if we think that survival in an evolutionary sense kind of means procreation, okay, because not only does the individual survive, but their species survives. And the only way our species survives is through procreating, having babies. Um, when we, if you hear the phrase survival of the fittest, that simply means not survival of the person who can run the fastest or run the most or who is the strongest, but it's survival of the best adapted to procreate, the survival of the best adapted to pass on their genes. So to keep that really simple, to give an evolutionary explanation of behavior, you have to explain how that behavior helps us to survive and or procreate. Okay, and so in other words, you have to explain how that behavior helps us to pass on our genes in some way. And that's either through survival or procreating. So let's just have a look at a couple of examples. So one if, uh, example is attraction. And this example would be about, uh, this is an example of how we can explain a behavior from an evolutionary perspective because it helps us to procreate. Um, and if we think that a lot of research has shown that we've evolved to be attracted to people who show signs of good health and they show signs of healthy genes and so we want to procreate with these people we're attracted to these people because um, if we have babies with them then our offspring will have also have healthy genes and will have a higher chance of survival and therefore will have a higher chance of passing on our genetic material all right so that's an example there the survival is not directly linked to this but it's the the idea of passing on our genes and, and our genes survive that way. Um, if we think uh, an example of aggression and evolution would be more directly about um, survival in the short term, uh, which will allow us to pass on our genes later. So for example, uh, if, uh, aggression can help us maintain social dominance, right? It can keep us at the top of the social hierarchy. And if you're at the top of a social hierarchy, uh, it means that you've got more access to resources. You've got more access to the things that you need to survive, the things that you need for your children to survive um, and for your children to be healthy. So in this case here, we can see that it's not only about surviving in the short term, right? We can have the, the food and means that we need to survive, but also we can protect for our offspring to make sure that, that our genetic material and our offspring is going to survive as well. All right, so that's the, uh, a couple of examples there. But um, if we go a little bit more advanced than this, uh, we, we think, okay, if behavior helps, uh, helps procreation, uh, or survival, then our genes get passed on, and the biology that helps that behavior also gets passed on, our offsprings show the same behavior, it's a little bit of a loop. But I think now we're getting just a little bit too detailed, so I don't think you have to go that far if, if you feel a little bit lost by this point. Um, and and uh, you, we haven't talked about genetic mutations, which are key in the evolutionary process. Um, that's kind of the, the trigger at the beginning of the whole thing. So if there's a genetic mutation that's helpful for survival or procreation, that's going to be passed on as well. Okay, um, and we can sort of diagram basically like this, right? If we, we start with the genes, maybe this is a mutation. If that leads to a behavior that helps us to survive or, or procreate, then that gene's going to get passed on. That's going to help the behavior and so on and so forth. And so there, that's how that behavior continues throughout history because it, it, um, it's always getting passed on. Now let's look at a specific example, fear. Now I think this is a really good one to write about in exams because I think it, um, we can explain this from a number of perspectives and we also have some um, pretty good research to show to support it. So we've got an evolutionary explanation of fear. Now, we tend to be afraid of dangerous things, right? Spiders, snakes, the dark, heights, things that can hurt us. So 
to put it very simply, I mean, we, we um, fear helps us to avoid those things. Fear helps us to stay out of the dark where we don't know if danger is coming or not, or it helps us to avoid dangerous animals. It helps us to avoid dangerous people. And so if we can avoid, if we're afraid of these things, we're more likely to avoid them. And that's going to help us stay out of danger. That's going to help us survive. That's going to help us survive long enough so we'll pass on those genes, pass on our genes to our offspring, who will also be afraid of those things, presumably. Um, Right, so it's a very basic explanation of fear. Now, the issue with this basic explanation yet is uh, it's pretty tricky to show studies that support it, or to show any you know worthwhile studies. So we have to go a little bit further. And how we go further is we introduce the role of the amygdala in the fear response. And so our amygdala plays a key part in generating a fear response and generating fear. That's where the emotion comes from. And so our amygdala can perceive threats in our environment. In fact, our amygdala can perceive a threat before we're even consciously aware of it. If you see, um, if you see something you're afraid of, uh, your amygdala knows about it and has activated your stress response even before you're consciously aware that you've seen something um, that, you knows, um, that you know you're afraid of. I think that's amazing about the amygdala. Now, we can look at SM's case study to show the amygdala is key in experiencing fear. And so this is um, so here I think this gives us the whole explanation of the evolutionary explanation of fear if we introduce the, the role that the amygdala plays in it as well. And we can use SM's case study. Okay, so here we have, if looking at our example, um, the genes that produce a fear response based in the amygdala, that's going to um, increase our chance of survival because we're going to be afraid of those things and then we're going to pass on the genes that... Um, that allow for that amygdala to have that fear response. And therefore, our offspring's also going to have that fear response, and that gets passed on, and so on and so forth. So um, the case study on SM, a, a quick recap here. This is written in the textbook, and uh, it'll be in the revision book as well. Um, but she has a rare genetic condition, so she has bilateral amygdala damage. We see the amygdala is a little yellow, but here we've got one on both sides. Some people have um, damage to one side. She's very rare in that she has damage to both, um, so she's a very, very valuable case to study. Uh, and so the, the, the previous studies have shown that she can't um, recognize fear in other people's faces and she can't be taught to be afraid of things, which is what fear conditioning is. Um, and they just want to see, right, do, do you need a, a, an amygdala to experience fear? So they gave her three tests. Um, they took her to an exotic pet store, a haunted house, and they showed her some different film clips. So just to talk about the pet store, they took her, um, researchers followed her, they had you know, their notebooks and they took her to an exotic pet store. When they asked her, how do you feel about snakes and spiders? She said, yeah, I don't really like them. I try to avoid them. When she got into the store, she was just intrigued, amazed. Um, she wanted to go see, touch the big snake. She's thinking, this is so cool. No fear response whatsoever of these very, very dangerous animals. All right. Um, so here we see in this situation, uh, she did not display any fear. Haunted house, once a year they take this big psychiatric hospital, they decorate it out as one of those haunted houses, um, and you walk through it. And she walked through there with a group of five um, healthy females, uh, just as control, and while the others, uh, the other females were, you know, screaming and shrieking, um, SM was not uh, phased at all, you know, she'd walk through and say, come on guys, follow me, um, did not show any fear response. I think at one point she even um, scared one of the monsters by mistake because she came around a corner and they weren't expecting her. So again, in a very, very scary situation, no um, no fear response at all. So this study is really good for showing the amygdala uh, is very key in experiencing fear. The tricky thing is it's it's a little bit difficult to make the leap to then survival with the results of this study. So here is a really key detail. I think this is for this particular topic. This is the most important detail from this study, and this is a direct quote from the original article. So SM's been held at knife point and gun point. She's been physically accosted, meaning um, like confronted by a woman twice her size, and she's nearly killed in an act of domestic violence. Um, and she's been explicitly threatened with death. She lives in a very dangerous neighborhood, so she's constantly ex um, exposed to danger. And we see here what stands out. Most in that these, in, in many of these situations, SM's life is in danger, yet her behavior lacked any sense of desperation or urgency. And the police reports corroborate that, so that that's not just um, from SM's self-report, but the police reports of the instances actually suggest that as well. She didn't show any fear. So what this key detail here shows that if without a lack of fear, you can find yourself in really d difficult situations and you might not have an appropriate response, right? Which means you might not avoid going back to the same places where you were in danger, or you might not feel like you need to run away from these situations where you're almost feeling like you're going to be in danger, and that this can be very, very dangerous to our survival. So that's a key detail there in that study. Now, um, that would be enough for a short answer response, but if we want to develop even further, then we can look at the role of fear and memory. So um, I said earlier about the amygdala plays a key role in fear, 
The amygdala tr triggers the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, and that releases the stress hormone cortisol. Cortisol can help us remember emotional information or uh, emotional memories. So actually a short burst of cortisol during stress can improve your memory. And this can be explained from an evolutionary point of view. Because if you think, uh, if we get ourselves into danger, if we get into dangerous situations and we release cortisol at that time, well, in the future we'll remember, hey, I remember this situation, this is a little bit dicey, I'm going to get out of here. For example, you're walking down, um, uh, you know, going through a dangerous neighborhood and you, and you get mugged or you get held up at knife point like SM. The next time you're in that neighborhood, you're going to have that memory of, oh man, I remember this, right? I'm going to go home a different way. Uh, it might even help you remember um, encounters you've had with other people, dangerous people. Um, it might help you uh, if you think about our ancient ancestors, you know, walking through the forest. They might remember where it was that they saw that poisonous snake or where they um, saw that lion's den. So they're not going to be, be back there in the future. Now, the study that shows that is this one here um, from Buchanan and Lavallo. Uh, so they had um, 48 healthy participants, so 50-50, um, you know, half and half. Um, and so what they had was one group took cortisol and one group took a placebo. And then they showed them different types of um, pictures. And then they had to rate the emotional impact. And then also, after a week, they asked them to recall what they remembered. And what they found was that the cortisol didn't affect how emotional their emotional response to the images, but it did affect their ability to remember those. Um, meaning that those who took cortisol could had a better memory of the pictures that they found emotional. All right, and so what we can see here is that that release of cortisol we might get if we're feeling fear can uh, enhance our consolidation, so transfer of short term to long term, uh, of emotional memory. And this can be explained from an evolutionary perspective. This can be explained at how it can help us to survive. If things are emotional, they might, and if things are, in this case, we're talking about the emotion of fear. If things are fearful, frightening, dangerous, we can remember them, then we can avoid it in the future. And so this study can help us support that. Um, and yeah, so we, um, we, can avoid, we can avoid that danger in the future. Uh, yep, um, if you're studying PTSD, we look at the release of cortisol, uh, one downside to this is that it might also explain symptoms of PTSD, like long-lasting intrusive memories. So if you have a really traumatic event, then you might want to you want, might want to shake that memory, you might want to lose that memory, but it sticks with you. Uh, and this can be a downside to this um, release of cortisol and its effect on memory. Okay, so let's review and look at, if you got asked this in a short answer question, let's say you were asked, it would be something like, I would anticipate, Outline one evolutionary explanation of behavior. I think that type of question is what you're going to get for a short answer question. I think your central argument here would be um, explain how fear can be explained from an evolutionary perspective, right? How does it help us avoid danger, increase chances of survival? And then I think use SM's case study for that, that the amygdala is key in feeling fear, and how and the key detail that I highlighted there about the dangerous situation she's been in, um, which we can put down to her lack of fear, uh, and how that can be dangerous. For a short answer question, that would get you top marks if you do that in detail, if you can do that in about 300 to 400 words. Now, an essay question, we have to add a little bit more detail because you're wanting to write at least 900 to 1,000 words. So our central argument would stay the same, just the same as the short answer response. And SM, so you, your, your first three to 400 words of an essay would be exactly like the short answer question. But then we want to develop that argument, and that's where I would introduce the amygdala and the role of cortisol. So you're kind of almost continuing your central argument on again here um, and, and going further by saying it's not only the amygdala feeling fear, but the amygdala's release of cortisol during um, the feeling of fear and how that can help us to survive. And use Buchanan and Lavello. So here you've got two good studies and that's going to um, increase your score in the, not only the knowledge and understanding because you've got two detailed explanations, but also in your use of research because you've got two studies here. But you need to show critical thinking. And so here are just some possible critical thinking points you can be mentioning. Um, you can be talking about, uh, can all common phobias be explained rationally? So but maybe up here you've given some examples of um, phobias, like we said, um, dangerous animals, heights, um, even um, disease-ridden animals like rats, mice, cockroaches. Uh, makes sense that this is a pretty rational fear. But can you think of any fears that maybe can't be explained from an evolution perspective, that, that maybe aren't so rational? That you can say, well, a fear of that doesn't really necessarily help us to survive. It seems a little bit of an odd fear. That might be that might be common, mind you, right? We can come up with all sorts of random anomalies, but I can think of at least two uh, phobias that are pretty common that may not be explained rationally. Now, I'm not going to tell you what they are, right? Annoyingly, but this is your critical thinking, not mine. Um, and are we innately afraid of things? So this is saying that fear um, comes from our biological um, innate tendencies like our amygdala perceives her in that generic fear response. So we're saying it's genetic, um, but can we be, can we learn to be afraid of things? Um, and 
if so, does that then question this idea of fear being an, um, an evolutionary response? Uh, or can it be both, right? And so here we have an alternative explanation. Uh, now we can, and we can also evaluate the studies. If we look at SM study, now this is one person who had a rare genetic disorder. Does this affect our generalizability? If we look at um, Buchanan and Lavallo's study, they were shown still images of a of um, just still photos. Now, does that affect how we can generalize that to real life situations? And to elaborate on that, can you think of any real life situations that might be different to that? And why we might not expect those same results? Why might we not expect the same effects of cortisol in a real life situation? Um, you might also think about here, are there any individual differences between people that might affect that ability of cortisol on memory? Um, for example, are there any other parts of the brain that might be influential in, in um, moderating or affecting that process of cortisol's uh, effects on memory? Now, if you could do all that uh, in your answer in about 900 or 1,000 words, right, that would be pretty awesome. So, if you feel a little bit drowned here, a little bit lost, um, I think just to remember these two simple points when focusing on an evolutionary explanation of behavior. Number one, explain how the behavior helps us to pass on our genes. Now you've got lots of possible behaviors you can explain, fear is just one. As long as you can understand how the behavior helps us to pass on our genes and you can explain that, then you are giving an evolutionary explanation. Second one, explain how the studies show, uh, show the behavior can help us pass on our genes. Right, either through survival or procreation. If you can, and if you can describe the studies and explain that, then you're doing fantastic. All right. So uh, just a couple of tips for teachers. Um, if you're a teacher watching this, then I think there's so many behaviors can be explained from an evolutionary perspective. I mean, on this uh, video, I touched on three really good ones that that I try and cover in my course in my book: um, aggression, fear, and attraction. So what I try and do is I don't tell students at the beginning, you know, this is your evolutionary um, explanation behavior topic. Uh, I just sort of teach them naturally through the course. I teach aggression and criminology, attraction and love and marriage, um, and fear also in um, criminology and later in PTSD. And so I just teach them naturally. And then at the end of the course, you know, when we're reviewing the, the individual topics, I then tell students, look, here are your options. And you choose the one that fits you based on what other parts of the course you're going to focus on. Um, so, for example, if they were studying, uh, wanting to write about PTSD um, or an emotion and memory, then they might go for fear. If they wanted to focus on um, love and marriage and really nail that exam question, then they might do, if this is a stand level student, and then they might do um, the attraction topic. If they're preparing to write essays about biological approach, they might do aggression. Um, if they're preparing essays for the cognitive approach, they might do um, cortisol and fear because that links with emotion and memory. So, you know, they can just choose based on their preferences. Alrighty. Um, well, I, I hope this was helpful. Um, I'll put all the links in the description of this. We've got our store, Facebook group, blog, um, loads of places to find other help. Um, also, if, you, if there are videos, topics that you'd like some help on, if you want me to make a similar video for any other topic in the course, please um, pop a comment in the description. Uh, I made this video. Thank you, Sarah, um, for the request for this. It really helps if people say, hey, can you make a video about? Um, because then I don't have to think uh, and I can just yeah do those that are most needed. So thank you very much.